I just want to read a couple of short verses here. Verse 18 says, after the high priest, which is of the sect and all that were with them, the sect of the Sadducees were filled with indignation at the things that were being done at the hand of the apostles by the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 18, they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. Let's pause there and pray. Father, we're thankful today for the Word. It always speaks to our hearts, no matter seems where we turn in it. You always have pertinence and uh, meaning to our walk, and we're thankful today, God, for the, the leading of the Holy Ghost and for the power that abides in your word. Speak to us now, Lord, through this, your servant. Lord, we pray let your word be clearly heard. Lord, speak in our hearts and let us be moved and shaped by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. What constitutes a miracle? <coughs> so often, this word is invoked when we are confronted with bad news or impossible circumstances, extreme need in our lives, then we say it's time for a miracle. Quickly, the declaration is made when things look bleak, where they can't see a way out by natural means. We need a miracle. According to Webster's Dictionary, a miracle is an event that appears unexplainable by the laws of nature and so is held to be a supernatural act of God. Amen. Now, God's Word is replete with miraculous occurrences. However, they always seem to be coupled with dark days and dire circumstances. It seems like when God's people found themselves in a heap of trouble, that a miracle was right on the heels. That there was something good about to happen, but it had to get pretty bad before you'd expect and anticipate the miraculous intervention of God. It appears that miracles, if I can put it in these terms, it appears that miracles and midnight go hand in hand. Yes, indeed, it's in our darkest night that we desire a marvelous, unexplainable event to transpire in our serious situation. So exactly how does, I pose the question tonight, how does one procure a miracle? In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed. This is a different jail term. We read from Acts chapter 5, a jail sentence the apostles experienced, and it looks like it says the apostles, so I'm thinking that they just rounded them all up and put them all in jail in Acts chapter 5. Uh, but in Acts chapter 16, we have a different encounter with the jail. And this time, it's only Paul and Silas that they 
At midnight, it says, Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises to God and the prisoners heard them. Now, on their way to a prayer meeting, Paul and Silas never expected on that day that they would be thrashed and imprisoned by the close of the day. When they woke up that morning, they were not thinking, well, today's a good day to get a whooping and to go to jail. <laughs> you never know what a day is going to hold for you. You don't know where you're going to be at midnight at the close of the day when you wake up in the morning. What you're going to be facing and what's going to happen. On their way to a prayer meeting, Paul and Silas never expected to be thrashed and imprisoned by the close of the day. Nevertheless, when the clock struck 12, that's exactly where they were. They were in bondage. They were battered and they were bloodied as a result of an unjust state of affairs. They did nothing to deserve it. If it was only by their own deeds and actions that they would receive uh, the recompense, then they would not have expected to be treated thusly. Against this backdrop of suffering within an extenuating environment, it was time for a midnight miracle. Hello? Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, midnight, praying, praising, probably unable to sleep from the extreme pain and the awkward position of the stocks, the chains that were on their ankles, their hands. Paul and Silas chose rather to pray and to praise instead of doubt and to pout. We can learn something from that, can't we? We sometimes choose the pity party route, but oh, let's learn from Paul and Silas today. Pray and praise instead of doubt and pout as, as they're... As they're uh, as, as, their, uh, as their praise begins to come forth from the dismal depths of that inner prison, something began to transpire in the heavenly realm. It's funny that, or it's odd, it's a marvelous thing. Maybe marvel is a, is a better way of saying it. It's a it's a marvelous thing that our praise can transcend the here and now, that our worship goes beyond what we can see, and somehow or the other it does something over there. I don't know how that works, Sister Sarah. Like there's a sponge or, or like it's a, it's a thin veil and stuff bleeds through from here to there and that they are able to know and experience the things that we are going through and the response of our hearts to them. and Sitting there on the throne of heaven while resting His feet on the footstool of earth. I can picture it this way. God begins tapping His feet. His foot. You know how they do when good music is playing. God begins tapping His foot to the rhythm of their rejoicing. That's what that earthquake was. Sister Helen has said when it rains, that's God's tears. And when it thunders, that's God's, His voice. <laughs> and I can just well imagine that the praise meeting, the worship center that was going on there in Acts chapter 16 down in that prison Cause God to start, you know, this, he says that the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Well, wasn't there an earthquake? Couldn't we imagine tonight? God was tapping his foot. Somehow God liked the music that he was hearing. <laughs> Somehow he began to participate and he started to join in their song. And when God started singing, salvation was sent. Let me substantiate that with a verse from the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. 
Oh, yes, I can imagine it. The Lord joined in to their song of praise. Hallelujah. The praise released his power and the prison doors were no match for him. And a miracle happened. And suddenly it says in Acts 16, 26, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Every time God opened the prison doors in the book of Acts, it was in the middle of the night. And that's what I want you to see tonight. As we look at some of these scriptures, the first time it happened is the one we've already read from Acts chapter 5. The chapter opens up with Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5. And instead of agreeing together in prayer, they agreed to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. It produced a dangerous consequence. And God stepped in swiftly and cleaned up His church. And Scripture tells us that great fear fell on all the church and everyone else who heard about this happening as they took out Ananias and Sapphira and buried them. Well, this resulted in many signs. The fear of the Lord resulted in many signs, wonders, and and a oneness of the believers as they were united together in one accord in Solomon's port. Believers started coming in right and left. The scripture tells us that sick folks were healed in the streets of Jerusalem. Other surrounding towns began to join in. Everything was wonderful when whammo. Yes, whammo. That's King James. No, it's not. <laughs> whammo. Somebody got really upset. Acts, 15, Acts chapter 5 and verse 17 is where we read tonight. They locked away with indignation. They got mad about what the disciples were doing. They locked away the apostles, and the devil thought he fixed up that revival real good. He said, well, here's what we'll do about that. These disciples who are causing all this ruckus, we'll put them all in jail and see what happens. Lock them up. Throw away the key. Lock up them preachers. That'll fix our problem. But God owns the key. I'm here to tell you. God owns the key to every prison. Every prison the devil ever constructed, God holds the keys to it. Acts chapter 5 verse 22. Get the picture here. There's these strong uh, macho uh, soldiers. And they're standing there outside of the gate of the prison, thumping their chest and rattling their sword, you know, like soldiers do, throwing their weight around and telling jokes about what they're going to do if these guys get out of hand and, you know, being tough and all that, like bullies would do. And uh, these, uh, all the while they were guarding, here's what they didn't know. They were guarding an empty cell. God had worked in the nighttime. And it reminds me of another story. Uh, the officers came, verse 22, it says, and they found them not in prison. They returned and told them, saying, The prison truly we found was shut safely with the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we opened, we found no man within. You talk about a miracle. That's a bigger miracle than Paul and Silas. At least with Paul and Silas, they went naturally through the gates that was rattled with an earthquake and got open and went on out into the street. But here, they carried them right on out through the bars that weren't e the locks weren't even opened. How did the Holy Ghost do that? That's the nature of a miracle, you see. All of them were let out by the Spirit of the Lord by night. Well, it reminds me of a story I started to tell you earlier about John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene. You might remember her. She came up to the tomb of Jesus while it was still dark. And the high priest had all posted their guards, just like the ones that are posted here in Acts chapter 5. It's not the first time he'd done that, you see. They're standing outside this gate guarding it, and what the miracle had already happened on the inside, the resurrected Christ, you see, 
Hallelujah. They, no matter what the enemy can do to post their guard and to keep us in bondage, God can do better. He's got the key. He knows he holds the way of deliverance. And there ain't no weapon that's formed against us that's going to prosper. There's no prison cell that can hold you captive and there ain't no grave that can hold your body down. We're on the winning side here. Romans 8 and 11, If that spirit which raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, then he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I'm here to comfort you tonight with my words. God has the key to your prison cell. And he can send an angel in the middle of your night. If the angel of the Lord shows up, let him, some advice here, let him bring you forth instead of clinging to your misery. Sometimes we get to liking our prison. We enjoy the attention. We enjoy the anguish, the whining. Acts chapter 14 relates another account, or Acts chapter 12. We've looked at Acts chapter 5 already. Acts chapter 12, I want to bring your attention to another prison break here. It relates to another account of a miraculous prison breakout. And here, Herod has sharpened his sword and killed James. When the Jews patted him on the back and thanked him for doing that, he said, well, that's, that's a good thing. I believe I'll try that again. So he went and got Peter, and he locked up Peter. And here Peter is enjoying the Passover, and before he's finished eating the Paschal lamb, he's in prison still wiping the juice off of his chin. He didn't see it coming. Wasn't expecting it when he woke up that morning, but here he finds himself middle of the night, midnight in prison. Well, then were the days of unleavened bread. And right in the middle of the party, Peter ends up in prison. Have you ever been there and done that? Maybe you hadn't been to prison, but you've probably found yourself in a heap of mess sometimes. But prayer was made, the scripture says, concerning Peter and his Encounter with trouble in the midnight hour. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And here's another element that's needed 
to procure that midnight miracle. We need prayer. We need prayer. Remember, Paul and Silas, they prayed and they sang praises to God. Now, here is Peter snoozing away. Now, Peter didn't have that same thing going on. Paul and Silas were praising God. God began to join in with them, tapping his feet, and an earthquake happens, and the prison gates go open, the, gate, the chains fall off, and they get let out. But here, Peter, he's just taking a little bit of a nap. And he remembers this place. The last time he was there, he didn't even get to finish getting a good night's sleep. He'd been there before, you know. It's not the first time Peter was in prison for this cause. This time he intended to make up for that. He's snoring away. <laughs> last time he didn't get a good night's rest, all that interruption with the deliverance and all that. <laughs> so this time he's making up for it. He's snoring away and and uh, between two more of those burly guards, a couple more on the outside of the prison, no more funny business this time. Herod didn't want to be outsmarted by an angel, so he put soldiers inside the cell. See, Herod heard about what happened last time. They just put the prison guards on the outside, and that didn't work. So this time he put them inside and outside both and chained them to the chained him to the prisoner. So he put soldiers inside the cell, but the soldiers and the cell are no match for God. Try as hard as you will, enemy. God's got the upper hand. And here comes an angel of the Lord again. Might have expected it. Probably the same one because he knew his way around real good. I don't know if it was the same jailhouse or not, but he knew his way around. And this is getting to be a regular occurrence, you see. The angel turned the light on, and Peter was sleeping so soundly he didn't even budge. So the angel smote him on the side, the Scripture says, and uh, then pulled him up and told Peter, hurry and get up. And uh, cracked the chains, fell off. Uh, he's ready to go down the road. Peter stood up there bewildered and the angel had to tell him how to get dressed he said gird yourself you know when you're sleeping you don't always know those things that come natural when you're awake he said gird yourself gird thyself in the king james and when they uh when they had had went past the uh the uh he was directed to gird up the inner garment that he usually wore, and that is to dress himself, to prepare himself to follow, to put on his shoes. And I uh, told him, to, you are going to walk out of here, Peter. You need to be properly shod to go where God is taking you, taking you to a place of deliverance. He said, put your garment, your, cast your garment about you. The outer garment was thrown loosely around the shoulders. It was neatly or nearly square and was laid uh, aside when they slept or worked or ran. So he put that the shoes on, he gird himself, and he put his outer garment on. Follow me. Uh, he was like sleepwalking, I suppose, because when Peter got out there, he found himself in the middle of the street, and he didn't know if it was a vision or if it was true. He was still just sort of trying to wake up. And uh, following the angel, sometimes we are commanded to walk in places where it's imperative to follow the leading of the Spirit. Sometimes we don't know exactly where we're going. Sometimes it's like we're in a fog. But still, we must follow on the Lord and trust that He is leading the way. Acts chapter 12 and verse 9, And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed through the one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. 
He thought about it a while as he walked along, and all of a sudden he looked up and realized that he was at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, and he heard a prayer meeting going on and decided to join in. You remember the story, don't you? So he knocked on the door, and here's this group of people that's groaning for Peter, and when God does this midnight miracle, they just don't believe it. And we are so quick to believe the negative, and we need proof to believe the positive. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Here's a case in point. Remember Hezekiah? The word of the Lord came to Hezekiah and told him, get his house in order, he's ready to die. Right? Now, Hezekiah believed that report. He put his face to the wall and he began to pray and asked the Lord for 15, some more time, 15 more years or something like that. You remember? And, uh, and the word of the Lord came back to him again and said, okay then. But he didn't believe it. He said, in order for me to believe this, I want the sundial to move backwards 10 degrees. Believe that I'll be healed. You see how we are with human nature? We're quick to believe the negative without any proof. But when it comes to believing the positive, we want a confirmation. We want to put a fleece out. We want, we, we'll do just about anything but believe that something good's about to happen. But I just feel like something good is about to happen. I feel like something good is on its way. Hallelujah. You may be in a dark prison cell and may think that God has forgotten about you. In fact, you may be really familiar with a particular, that particular location. You may be in a place where, where you've been before. Spend a lot of time there maybe. Been there, done that. Problems on every hand. But I've come to tell you tonight that God is going to turn the light on. He's going to say, wake up. Get yourself dressed and get out of there. God is a great delivering God. He's always right on time. He's never forsaken his own. God likes to show up when it's dark because that is his dwelling place. You wouldn't think so, but let's look what 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12 says. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Where can I go from his presence? If I go to the heavens, he's there. If I go to the pits of hell, he's there. He will dwell in thick darkness. Aren't you glad that in the midnight, when times get darkest, when, when you have trouble on every hand, and when, it, when you seem to be groping through a dark place, God is there. 2 Chronicles 6 and 1, Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said that he would dwell in thick darkness. He made the darkness in his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Psalms 18, verse 11. You may have to go to the depths of darkness, but that is the sight of his secret place. And God will surely meet you there. Psalms 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Under his shadow in the dead of night, deliverance will be brought forth. Amen. At the stroke of twelve, in your life, remember to heed the words of the psalmist in Psalms 119, verse 62. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. Miracles at midnight. In the midst of the night, instead of agonizing over your obstacles. Remind yourself that the Almighty is in control and have a thankful heart. Guard your heart. Guard your thoughts. 
and remind yourself that the Almighty is in control. And that ought to be enough for us to be thankful. Lift your praises to the Lord from the lowest part of your prison. As your worship ascends toward heaven, something will happen in the eternal regions of glory. I can't quite explain how it happens, but I've seen it happen. And I believe that it happens this way. God is going to rejoice with you. <laughs> and when he starts singing, dear friends, look out. Because there's a miracle about to happen. Hallelujah. An unexplainable supernatural event will occur as earthquakes ensue, foundations are shaken, prison doors fly open, every band is loosed, for this is the way our God works. If you need a miracle, it just might happen at midnight. Let's stand together. You might be saying tonight, Job, like Job said in Job 35 and verse 10, Where is God, my Maker, who giveth songs in the night? In Psalms 32 and verse 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Keep looking up, friends, even in the darkness of night. Miracles oft times happen at midnight. We need not be afraid of the dark. Have faith in God. Weeping might endure through the night, but joy comes in the morning. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in my father's house than to dwell in the tents of the wicked forever. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Dismissed in Jesus' name. Shake hands. Be friendly.